Welcome to The Last Call. It's a conversation between two boozy hacks who are both super excited and also very afraid about what might happen on Tuesday. Trump again, or um, the United States of America coming back um, as a bit of an all right place. Who knows? So uh, my name's John Sweeney. I'm in London. I'm drinking Italian red as usual. And um, in New York. Where do you live in New York? The great borough of Queens. Uh, Just down the road from where Donald Trump went to high school, in fact. <laughs> We've got cheap. a lot to answer for. It's cheap um, and it produces some terrible people and some good people. Uh, you decide, folks. Michael Weiss is drinking uh, same gin. old yeah. Japanese gin. Yeah, it's I've switched. The standard for me. I'm, um, I've switched bottles. I'm drinking um, Valpolicella Repasso, um, which is a rather nice, it's a bloody nice wine uh, from Villa, Villa Boghetti. And um, I think the next time I come to London, I got to go to yours because I want to check out your wine cellar. Mm. You, you seem to be a connoisseur, which is a, a, a euphemistic way of saying alcoholic, but <laughs> you do know your stuff or you, you give the appearance of knowing your stuff. The, I'm a, um, I'm a, I'm a low functioning alcoholic, I like to think. Um, yeah. I don't, uh, annoyingly, uh, my son and his flat, he's got a cellar. Um, so we can, and he's actually got wine in the cellar. I don't, um, I don't have a cellar, so I have a cupboard. Um, and, and what I have to do is go, I go to the, uh, the local wine shop, um, Majestic, which is the nearest nice one, uh, to uh, buy Plonk in an embarrassingly frequent way, as if I'm sort of giving uh, wine out to other people, which I'm not really. So. <laughs> anyway, how I've, okay, so um, our free listeners will know that I um, put 500 quid on uh, Joe Biden to win back in March when the odds were quite good, but I'm worried about my bet in that I'm worried about the delivery of the election. The, what's going to, what you can kind of see what Trump's going to do because all the pollsters um, or the smart ones um, are prophesying that on the day the Republican vote will be very good because loads of Democrats have voted before and, and there's a delay in counting. Am I right? Can you talk me through that? How's it going to work on the day? I mean, <sighs> I am the last person who can weigh in on the science of electoral politics. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it seems to be the case from the reporting that there has been a lot of early voting. It was freezing cold and raining today and yesterday. And there's photos from Madison Square Garden of New Yorkers lined up in those conditions with umbrellas, just waiting for hours on end to go and vote. Um, now that's New York. And you would assume most of those voters are Biden supporters. But yeah, I mean, he's, he's still holding his rallies, his super spreader events, um, and they're, they're well turned out. Um, and he seems that, I, I read an interesting piece, I think it was in the Houston Chronicle today, I put it up on Twitter, where, and I'm sure that has been reported already, but it's the first time I've seen it in print, where he has started to entertain the idea of his own political demise. He's now forecasting or at least indulging in the prospect that he won't win again. And what will happen in his own febrile, febrile mind is Joe Biden will take credit for all of Donald Trump's glorious achievements, particularly in the handling of COVID. Um, and, but there's also a sentiment that he has, which I said to you yesterday on the show, I said, I, I get the impression just listening to him, reading his deranged tweets that he, he wants, he wants to be done with this. There's something in his, inner being that's just exhausted, um, demoralized by it. And, and frankly, he doesn't find it entertaining anymore. You know, he won't be able to campaign again. Second term, he won't be able to go out on the campaign trail and hold the rallies. I mean, he might do it just for its own sake, but it'll have no import to him. There will be no gold star at the end of that, meaning a, a, another election to win. Um, and so for him, I think if he loses and he loses soundly, he will go, but he will go quite loudly protesting that he's actually won. Won't make a difference though in practical terms. And then he'll go off and found his media empire, return to reality television. He will be the most obstreperous and omnipresent ex-president the country has ever had. 
but he will also fade away because the, the, the media simply won't pay him the attention that it does now. And so his cult of personality will, will remain for the hardcore supporters, the, the, the diehard MAGA types, but it just, it won't be as consequential. It's not gonna be front page of the New York Times anymore, thank God. Um, now, does that mean that the, the political climate or the culture is going to shift? I, I'm a little less sanguine about that. I, I think no, I think we're in for, you know, the, the, the polarization or the kind of, almost as America is a, a state of cold war with itself, that's gonna endure beyond Trump. Or as we would say, covering an Arab country, Trumpism without Trump. Yes, um, or um, yes. So, I mean, what I'm afraid of, I was looking at uh, some of the uh, stuff by Nate Silver on Twitter, 538, and it showed that, for example, voting in Pennsylvania, uh, the ex expectation is, if I've got it right, there's gonna be a kind of red surge on polling day because Republicans are choosing to vote on the day and mm. Democrats have chosen to, uh, to vote beforehand. By the way, have you voted? Not yet, no. I'm gonna go on the day. Why is that? Uh, I've had all kinds of problems with the um, voter registry. I put in, I, I applied for my mail-in and I put in my home address and they said, this, this is invalid, it doesn't exist, which is not true because it's my DMV record is here, everything should be here. So I've just had, and you know, if you call up you know, any kind of government agency now, you won't speak to a human being. So I just figured, fuck it. Even if the, the address is wrong on my driver's license, which it is, because that's about 15 or 20 years out of date, you can still get, I think, a provisional ballot or whatever they call it, and then the, they do the checking later. So it's better to actually talk to a human being and say, this is me, here's proof of my identity, mm. this is where I live, here's my registration, everything, and then get to vote. And um, you're an investigative journalist in New York State. And you have yeah, I mean, look, every, every vote counts. Eh, mine doesn't really. I mean, you know, New York will go to Biden. Um, and mine counts, I suppose, in the sense that it adds to the popular vote, which you also want to see Joe categorically and unambiguously take from him. Um, but, you know, if I lived, I'd be much more exercised about this yeah. state of limbo if I was in Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania or Ohio. But New York, it's like you, you live in California. You, you know where that's going to go. So here's, okay, so let me set out the reasons for the Sweeney wobble. I would, um, and number one is what you've just been talking about, that basically it's in Trump's interest to make it more and more difficult for his, um, for his opponents or people who don't agree with him um, to vote. So you've got, a, an, um, you've got a voting system which is malevolently and deliberately understaffed and underfired um and it doesn't have um you know you would have thought in the 21st century it would be very very easy to vote in the united states it isn't they've made it more difficult and new york's new york so what i'm really worried about is georgia florida michigan um all these places um i don't know the um the local politics but certainly Florida is run by the Republicans at the moment, yeah? So you've got a, there's an issue there. The second thing is that he's gonna signal, I don't think that is going to stop what um, a Biden victory because the gap is too big. Yeah, well, yeah. we hope, yeah. The second thing, the second reason for the Sweeney wobble is that he's going to make merry he's going to not he's going to make mayhem he's going to call chaos like the bad um 1950s marvel comic sort of batman enemy um the penguin the joker he's going to muck about and this could cause blood spilt so that if he tells his base he's been robbed you can imagine them getting their submachine guns their machine, effectively their assault rifles start shooting people yeah. in, in polling stations in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and generating sufficient chaos, it becomes very hard to actually count the votes in a fair way. Mm. I mean, yes, but, you know, look, I am seeing encouraging signs. I think today it was announced that Texas has seen record turnout for a presidential election. Uh, now, that could go either way because it's Texas, right? But, um, you know, these are there are districts in the state where 
I think even Beto O'Rourke had beat Ted Cruz for the senatorial race. So, you know, there's a kind of purplish tinge to that contest now. Um, and yeah, I mean, a third, I believe, or perhaps even more now, of likely American voters have already voted in some form or another. So yes, you're quite right. Day of, there could be carnage on the streets. There could be acts of violence. In fact, I would hazard to guess there probably are going to be such things. And there's absolutely, I mean, this is not speculative. I think it's, it's, it's rooted in precedent. Donald Trump will be tweeting all throughout the day, you know, massive voter fraud reporting, stolen ballots, ex, you know, but I think we've reached a point, John, where it's kind of interesting. I, I actually, I was trying to figure out a way to thread this needle with an editor because I think it's a fascinating piece. You know, I mentioned to you yesterday that the, the, the Tucker Carlson dog ate my disinformation, <laughs> but that is the message itself. Today I found, I found there was some Republican re rapid response team which put out a statement like, we object to how the narrative has been constructed. So all of a sudden you've got the party of law and order, Judeo-Christian values, traditionalist, you know, virtue, um, kind of classical, you know, empiricist philosophy. Now they all sound like a bunch of fucking French postmodernists talking about the text and the narrative and the subtext and, you know, the signifier. I mean, you know, like what has happened to the Republican Party? They've crawled up so far up their own ass that, you know, and, and, but you can tell, you can tell it's out of sheer desperation and sheer exhaustion. So you know, Tucker, Tucker tries this, tr this trick. We have the goods. We've got the Pentagon Papers on Hunter Biden, but they got lost in the mail. And then within 24 hours, you know what? Leave poor Hunter Biden alone. He's suffered enough in his life. We're, we're, we're giving up you know, that talking point or that attack line. Let's just move on to more substantive issues like Mexican rapists stealing over the border and so on and so forth. It, it's, it's, you're seeing the psychosis in real time, not just to remember it, before it was Trump, and yes, the fish rots from the head, but it took a while. But now it is the party, it is the cultural firmament that has surrounded uh, him and that has it held him aloft for so long. There is political psychosis happening. And the good news is, none of this is making the slightest bit of difference. It doesn't seem to be penetrating. Now, perhaps there is this kind of, you know, walking dead, silent majority of, you know, kind of zombified MAGA types and, and then other people who have been persuaded by this and we just don't hear from them because they're afraid to, to voice their opinion. And I guess time will tell, election day will prove that. But so far I am seeing a great deal of skepticism, a great deal of eye rolling at everything that's being thrown, including tweets from the president himself that is just straight up disinformation about the, the, the security and sanctity of our democracy and, and voting. So, you know, I don't think that's deterring people. You know, the whole idea of, of you know, voter fraud equals voter suppression, it doesn't seem to be working based on the early numbers. That's, um, that's exciting. Uh, the other thing is the big numbers, for example, in, in democratic areas, I'm guessing Austin, Texas is voting in big numbers before. So there's more people have voted in Texas already than yeah, voted yeah. last time. Now what that means, I think, is that people who normally are people on the left who couldn't be bothered to vote for Hillary because she wasn't very different or whatever. I've got it that actually they've got to, they've got to go to the polling station. They've got to go and vote. And well, so not just on the left though. You've got, you've got sort of independence. You have small C conservative Americans who they look at Joe Biden and they see the ghoulish caricature that's been painted by the Republican party that this, that Joe Biden equals socialism, right? There is yeah. nothing to choose between him and Bernie Sanders or him and AOC. And nobody, nobody believes that. It yeah. just, even, even the propaganda selling it can't even sell it effectively. Yes. Yeah, you know that cartoon Ted Cruz tweeted out? It was like, you know, Joe Biden's at the head of the bus, but look, look, the bus is, you know, red Bolshevism or whatever, and AOC and Ilhan Omar and all. Is it? No, I mean, you know, first of all, the, the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party fucking hate Joe Biden. They couldn't stand that he won the primary. Yeah. They did everything they could to rob him of it, um, including trafficking allegations of sexual assault. And I'll remember those. It was kind of evaporated after a while. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think the average American sees him as, you know, the, the coming woke red menace. 
that he's been made out to be. And yet again, that is another epic fail of the current sort of age of postmodern rat fuckery. Um, and as we said yesterday, this is, you know, remember, he, Trump won on, I don't have time for total political correctness, and I'm not the establishment. Uh, now, you've got Joe Biden who says, mm, I don't have time for total political correctness either, but I am open minded enough to understand and sympathize with Black Lives Matter and all the rest of it. Uh, and as far as the establishment goes, don't you kind of wish you had a little more establishment in your life right now? Yeah. Don't you wish government was working for you? Don't you wish we put an end to this plague, which has robbed you of your family, which has robbed you of your, your livelihood and your income uh, and your emotional and psychological well-being? Yeah. So th that whole tear it up and start again routine, it hasn't really sold. It hasn't caught on. But by the way, if, if I was scripting a uh, Hollywood zombie movie while you're talking this stuff, which I think is fantastic and I'm, excited and lifted to hear it. I'll have a zombie with a MAGA hat come in and sort of rip your head off. Uh, <laughs> it's behind you, it's behind you. I'm doing this thing until the election, I, like three times a day I post mood and then it's a screenshot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of either a film scene or a musician or a historical figure of some kind. Yes. So this afternoon I posted a screenshot of Ian Curtis of Joy Division singing probably somewhere at some dive club in Manchester not realizing that Ian Curtis famously hanged himself. And somebody put below the, the tweet, doesn't bode well for you, my friend. And I didn't realize that, <laughs> you know, I probably might've been telegraphing a little too much of myself, but I didn't mean it that way. I just meant kind <laughs> yep. of dark and moody and brooding. Um, it, it, um, um, so I might welcome yeah. the MAGA zombie ripping my head off at this point, just to kind of- Hey, yeah, no, 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 uh, um, uh, Who's gonna look after your dog, mate? Uh, you're not doing that. Um, the, the thing which caused me great joy, um, and I recommend everybody, uh, our free listeners, um, possibly two by now, who, um, who watch this nonsense, is Donald Trump Jr. talking about, we're on top, you know, there are hardly any, any COVID um, deaths anymore, and everybody who says there are are morons. And this was on Fox, and the Fox presenter, the sort of classic blonde bimbo, um, was just kind of open mouthed and slow. And, and as Donald Trump, and it looked as though he, he, he'd taken an entire pyramid cone of, uh, of cocaine like five minutes before, but as he talked on and on about how they were on top, they were getting on top of the virus, the deaths were barely anything. And they're almost a thousand a day now, and the, and the cases are going through the roof. She was shaking her head. So it looked to me, and this was exciting, I thought that Fox, or at least there was more than enough people on Fox who are actually looking at the evidence looking at reality and saying, I don't buy this. Did you see that clip? I saw bits of the clip, yeah. Laura Ingraham, I think, was the uh, oh. presenter. And she, where, where she sit in the-, in the, in the Oh, I mean, Fox very TV. avidly pro-Trump. Um, but look, I mean, you know, I think to most of the Fox brass, certainly to Rupert Murdoch, as we said yesterday, the writing's on the wall in this election. <clears throat> and at the end of the day, it is a corporate media empire that cares about the bottom line. And, you know, whilst they'll support Trump, if he loses, I don't think that that's the hill Fox News wants to die on. They're, you know, in, yes. in other words, they're not going to support him beyond his presidency. They're going to be, they'll, they'll pivot right into being in the opposition again and going into attack mode against Biden and the Democrats and all that. But, you know, sort of the, the excesses and the mania of high Trumpism, I think they're going to have to put behind. And that's not to say, I mean, Fox, in many respects, is created Trump. Um, in other words, like they allowed him the latitude and they, they encouraged some of the conspiratorial thinking about Obama and, you know, ISIS, the rest of it. Um, but they're not, they're not wedded to the man. Um, they're wedded to power yes. and ideology. And, you know, he really doesn't have much ideology. So that's the other wrinkle in all of this. Um, so for them, it'll be going into bunker mode and then plotting the resurgence or comeback, probably in the midterm election. Who would, um, um, 
if if Trump fails and fails spectacularly, fingers crossed, who's the next Republican leader? Damn if I know, man. Um, I don't know. I mean, I could see Rubio making a play. Uh, I think he's. I think everybody, everybody who bowed to Trump is contaminated. My suspicion is it's it's somebody not for the Republican Party because that's the whole party. That's the whole party, bar forty-five to fifty percent of Mitt Romney. So yeah. who, uh, it means everybody, you know, unless there's some, you know, white knight who rides in who has not uttered a single word or had a single thought about Donald Trump for the last five years, uh, who can be sort of anointed on that basis alone, they're going to have to, it, no, it's going to be a memory hole. Like, oh, no, no, we didn't really support him. We just, we wanted conservative judges on the court, or we like the tax policy, or, you know, we like normalization between Israel and Arab countries. And it wasn't about him. Uh, well, fine, it wasn't about him, but you bent the knee at every opportunity. You didn't stick up, stand up for yourselves or what you purport to believe in. So no, they, they will completely forget about that. It's going to be who has the best shot of winning and, you know, and frankly, I think a lot of the electorate, unfortunately, you know, people will move past this Republican party. It will, yes. it will reinvent itself and people will forget what it has done over the last four years. Yes. I think the ones who actually will never forgive and forget are some of these never Trump ex Republicans, because for them, this has been, I mean, it's, in a way, it's sort of like abandoning communism and becoming an ex-communist, which is to say becoming the most perfervid anti-communist, right? Yes. It's almost a quasi-religious experience, leaving yes. Holy Mother Church. There, so, is, there, is, there is an intense, about the Lincoln Project. The Lincoln Project guys, yeah, and some of the guys who surround themselves with it, yeah. Their adverts, uh, there's a real passion, the passion of the, um, of the, the now disbelieving ex-believer. Exactly, um, and that's why and, they're so effective. Yeah, and and, and they are, they and the stuff they had. We talked about Reagan yesterday, but they had Reagan, um, Reagan talking about um, racial justice in a way that Trump never would, and um, and about helping ordinary people in the way that Trump kind of fakes it. And I, uh, I. I I've almost felt tearful listening to this stuff. It's it, beautiful, beautiful um, rhetoric. And what's fascinating is looking at um, where Corbyn is now. Mm. Like no one has resigned in sympathy. Nobody has left the Labour Party. And in fact, his, um, his, uh, his number one altar boy, um, and I say this as a former altar boy, it's a, I can abuse the Catholic Church because I used to be one. Uh, a member uh, or a believer, whatever it was, but uh, Len McCluskey, you know, is in telling people don't leave the Labour Party, but they're in a they're in a jam because it's becoming more and more bleeding obvious that the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn went down a dead end, and it was a dreadful one, and and he's um, and the poll numbers uh, for Keir, having made this uh, ballsy decision, are good. I'm yeah, no. among Labour Party members, I think a, a solid majority approve of his decision to suspend Corbyn, and then yeah. among normal, just everyday British voters, also a majority. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. He, is, he is acting out of principle, but he is finding himself in a position of doing the politically expedient, which is kind of, I mean, the miracle of successful politics, isn't it? Um, it was a ballsy thing. I'm, I, um, I didn't join uh, when I was free to do so. I joined the Liberals, not the Labour Party, and I wrestle with the two, um, as which is the more comfortable side of the bed, and I have done so my entire life. Yeah. Um, but um, I was, I didn't think it was a smart thing um, when I read the report um, yesterday, when I read the summary, the executive summary, I didn't think that Starmer would actually um, suspend Corbyn. And I thought politically that would be a foolish thing to do because it would divide the Labour Party. So I think it was an act of courage by Starmer, something which I would have av avoided, but obviously he's come out um, 
we got some more detail about it today. And essentially, all everybody had a um, um, a prior sense of what was going to happen. Yeah. And the problem that Keir, you know, Keir had made clear his line, which is we're going to set the recommendations in full and we're going to, you know, change things and move on. And what by saying that actually this was exaggerated. Um, Corbyn was ruining Starmer's were putting a line under us and they were mooning, uh, moving on in a way which was just unsupportable. What's fascinating is that they, um, the number of, the small number of people who are supporting them. And it, it feels as though that at least as far as, although, you know, we, we've ended up with this toxic and not toxically incompetent government because of Corbyn's weakness, we've ended up in the economic suicide or near suicide of Brexit. However, the Labour Party and um, the left is now got its common sense back. And so I'm hoping and praying. Um, I, I, I like to think I'm an ex -Catholic. It had, look, it had its, it, and it had its fever dream. Yes. It, it tried it out. And to some extent, people are still unconscious, right? They're still dreaming. Uh, and fine, let them. You know, like, I, I have no problem if Jeremy Corbyn wants to go down as the political or the, I should say, the ideological martyr of momentum, uh, squawk box, Novara Media, Owen Jones, and that lot, Seamus Mill, and that whole little cabal. By all means, have at it. You know, have at it. He's, I mean, Corbyn is, I think, kind of more Trot than Stalinist. If you know anything about Trotskyism, it's, it, it, it consigns itself to political irrelevance. Although the old Trots at least had something interesting to say about history and, and geopolitics. This lot, forget it. Uh, but that's fine. That, that, this, is, this is what I want. I want Jeremy Corbyn to go back to being a kind of cultish backbencher who steps in piles of his own shit because he can't keep his mouth shut about the Jews and the media. And he is defended by a very loud, but completely irrelevant and completely marginal subsection of the British left. And then that's it. It's, it becomes the stuff of blogs and tweets. And it has actually no bearing on society or the nation state in the least. This is fine. I am fine with that. Yes. Uh, and so what I'm hoping is if we can pull a second rabbit out the hat, and I'm, I'm again, I'm less... I'm much more pessimistic about this, just given the differences in political dynamics here, meaning the U.S. versus the U.K., but I don't think that's going to happen if Trump is defeated. Trump is not going to become a Jeremy Corbyn figure. Trump is, is going to become this sort of very sort of unavoidable, I mean, avoidable in the sense he won't be in the front pages of the New York Times, as I said, but still culturally unavoidable sideshow of American politics. And he'll still get on the Fox News. He'll still make a lot of noise. He might even create his own cable news empire, which will do probably very well. Or Corbyn doesn't have the wasta to do that. Or very badly, because he's a rubbish businessman. I am very happy. Yes, so that was the, the point I was wrestling. He's a rubbish businessman, but he's always been good at telly. Um, yeah. That I have to give him. I mean, he has gamed television to a, a really sort of remarkable degree that should be studied by future scholars of media. Um, and television created his presidency, and he knows it. Yeah, he, he's a kind of, I'm very happy for him to be a sideshow, and I think that's where it's going, and that's what I'm hoping and praying for. He's a kind of his own Lenny Riff, uh, Riff um, how do I pronounce it, Riffin style? Riffin style, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, he's uh, not as talented as Lenny Riffin He's not, he doesn't have the kind of aesthetic coherence for being a true propagandist. He, he has a kind of instinct. He's all id, yes. but the yeah. id works. It sells. It's yeah. funny. It's, it's a carnival show. People can't, it's like the, you know, the bearded lady or, you know, the Siamese twins in the cage. You can't look away. You're yeah. sort of equally sort of perplexed, horrified and intrigued he, and he, titillated, you know? So he, that's yes. what he represents. Yes. But, and, but he is, he, he's got a genius at that. He's Barnum and, He's a circus show master. Mm. Um, roll up, roll up, roll up for the bearded lady. He's not the, um, you know, he's not the show master. He's the exhibit. But he's an exhibit who has, at least has enough self-awareness, a little bit, to continue to make himself the exhibit. No, I think he is the ringmaster because he became president. 
So he's the ringmaster in the sense that he cracked the whip. And when the clowns uh, disagreed with him, um, he, he got rid of them. A question. Um, the good people around him, the good generals, Mattis, Kelly, why aren't they... Um, who's the, um, who's the, the National Security Advisor or the Secretary of State? The oil guy who said that Trump... Tillerson? Was more, sorry? Tillerson? Yeah. They all have spoken out. It's just they're not... Look, I think a lot of them feel like they've got dirty hands because they worked for him. Um, I mean, John Bolton, Christ, you know, he could have got on record about so much, including the Ukraine gate controversy, which got Trump impeached. But he chose not to. He chose instead to wait for his big payday to publish his book. So, I mean, he's just self-interested mercenary guy. I mean, a lot of, but a lot of, you know, including Republican national security types have all come out and said, I mean, this guy is, is the gravest threat to American democracy and the liberal post-war order since ever, really, since the end of World War II. Um, what would be interesting with what, four days, less than three days to go, is if George W. Bush came out and endorsed Biden, because he still does curry a lot of favor within the conservative base, particularly the evangelical wing of the Republican Party. I don't think he's going to do that, uh, but I know that he does support Biden over Trump. Uh, that's that's obvious. Um, but yeah, you know, you're kind of running out of. You're running. If McCain were alive, as we discussed yesterday, McCain would, I think, be he would be the thorn in Donald Trump's side in a way that Biden simply cannot be because McCain commands a lot of respect, particularly among uh, military types and military families. Uh, he's an internationalist Republican. He commands a lot of respect for what he did globally, particularly in Europe. Um, he, would, he would really get under Trump's skin. Uh, and so it's a shame that he's not around to, to see this. Yes, I loved um, uh, George W at the uh, inauguration and it was raining and he would he started a weird shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a weird shit. and also he started wrestling with his rain cape and there's a moment he's got a thing uh, with Michelle Obama they like yeah know, they have they, like a they French, genuinely yeah. like each other yeah. I mean the, the Obamas and the Bushes genuinely like each other um, which is a lovely thing and that's something that gives me great optimism for the the thing that I've always the thing I want the United States to be, which is to be this shining city on, upon a hill. I've always always fucking dreamed of it. But when George W. was wrestling with his rain cape, and and you could kind of see Michelle almost <coughs> cracking up because he was mucking it. He was clearly mucking about. And what he was doing was saying, "I find what the orange thing is saying ridiculous and wrong." And therefore, I'm going to start taking the piss out of it. Mm. So it'd be nice if he, um, if George W. I can't see him actually saying I'm voting for Biden, but I'd like to him. I'd like him to go to a polling booth or whatever, and 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 dog is scratching on the door. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. My my dog is. Uh, where's my dog got to? He gets daddy withdrawal. He, uh, he sat, I put the fire on and he sat in his basket staring at the flames as if they're funny orange rabbits. Uh, so uh, uh, he's, um, anyway, well behaved. But yeah, that'd be fun. But you've also got to look at the other way is that um, if Trump wins uh, and there is a path to victory, um, the pollsters say it's like one in 10, yeah, or um, yeah, but then, I mean, the New York Times, I remember sitting in Los Angeles the night of 2016 and watching in real time as the New York Times probability meter or whatever it's called went from something like 98% or 95% down, 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 down. And what was it when, when, when he won Wisconsin, was it, or Pennsylvania, one of those states, it just went like all the way down to and 5% for Hillary, and that was it, the game was over. So I, you know, again, and this is why Democrats are, they just refuse to believe their own lying eyes about the polls. Although there's a market difference because the, 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 the consistency of Biden's lead, I think is historic, and it's, it, that's something that Hillary never had. Also, I think yesterday, 
was the exact moment leading up to an election when the front page of the New York Times was, you know, new emails uh, or, or what was it, the Comey letter? No, no, the yeah. Comey letter had ha happened. Yeah, no, I think new it was the Comey letter. Into yeah, 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 yeah. So that derailed the momentum of her candidacy. Again, Biden hasn't had that. The best they can do is, <laughs> I'm not making this up. I saw a piece, I, I just saw a screenshot, uh, a website called Gateway Pundit. Now, I might be stepping in it here because th this could be a parody and I can no longer tell the difference between satire and reality. <laughs> but the, the, the screenshot suggested that Hunter Biden has got a Pornhub account and has uploaded videos of himself in flagrante delecto with members of his own family. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that's probably not the case. <laughs> but that's with three days, three days till the, the you know, the, the voting booths, the brick and mortar voting booths open. That, well, I suppose no, they have been open, sorry. Three days to election day. That that's the line they're gonna, they're, they're trying to make stick. And, he, and by the way, like even if, if the son were Jeffrey Dahmer, it's the son. What about the guy <laughs> who's running for president? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Again, it's a whiff of desperation. It's this, this is sort of, they're running on fumes here. And now look, I, anything can happen. It was reported today by Reuters. The, the, the GRU has been targeting uh, election infrastructure, targeting liberal think tanks. They haven't breached them this time around, but they've been targeting them, fine. I mean, that usually just means it's Friday, right? I mean, they haven't stopped trying to attack American institutions. Um, but it American does seem like- on the left that support Biden or that are defend uh, the, um, uh, the honesty and openness of the public square. So uh, they attack you... everybody. I mean, they, I mean, look, they targeted and, and probably, I think they, I think it was reported that they had breached uh, Republican email accounts, but they didn't leak any of that information because they yeah, supported okay. Trump the first yes. time. Yeah. So well, what's interesting is the noises from Moscow because mm. the, 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 there has been in the same way that Fox News is that essentially, uh, well, for the last um, um, five or six years, uh, Moscow's been Team Trump. That's changing, and they're putting out stuff, um, some of the Kremlin media putting out stuff that actually um, Trump may not win, um, we'll work with Biden. Yeah, Putin kind of had some some delicate words about, oh, you know, leave the sun alone. I don't see any evidence of illegality or corruption. So they're, they're, they're trying to come to grips, uh, resign themselves to the fact that they're looking at a Biden administration. And so that's going to be a give and take. So they, they you know, they're, they're still getting up to their old shenanigans, but I don't think they've got the neutron bomb of election interference waiting to go off. Because if they did that, at this stage, it would backfire. And I, I can tell you, based on my own reporting and what I know from internally in the Biden campaign, um, there would be hell to pay. Um, yeah. there, is a, there is a strong argument for sectoral sanctions that would, I mean, cripple the Russian economy in a way that the, the last sort of various suites of sanctions have not. Um, and yeah. I don't think Putin wants to go down that path this time around. And, you know, especially not to do something which then he doesn't get any joy out of, meaning, you know, Trump doesn't win. And then he yeah. has to face the music from a democratic government. This is the, um, it's, it's a nice um, note to, uh, to, uh, to lurch towards a conclusion on, in that you can feel the enemies of decency and democracy beginning to feel the chill. Moscow, there are people in Moscow who will be worried about a Biden presidency. Have I told you, have I, one of my mates has got a, um, a brother who's a nuclear submarine commander. Have I told you this story? Uh -uh. Anyway, the, uh, the th what they do is they, you know, they disappear, they leave the fast a nuclear base in the sub, the Trident missiles, and they lurk under Antarctica, and every now and then they pop up, punch through the ice, put the... Um, 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 just put an aerial through the ice and they switch on to Radio 4. And the proof of continuing British civilization <coughs> is listening to um, Nicholas Parsons introduced just a minute. That's the, that's the, the ultimate test. 
Nicholas Parsons is dead. So what I'm scared about... <laughs> Does that mean British civilization is too? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and that's, okay, let's, let's wipe out Moscow. So uh, what would be, uh, you know, the big, um, it's the last, uh, uh, tomorrow, an October surprise would be a British uh, Royal Naval nuclear submarine wiping out Moscow because the commander cannot hear Nicholas Parsons saying, welcome to just a minute. It's a nightmare, but it's the kind of thing every now and then I wake up at like sweating at four o'clock in the morning think, fuck me. Is that real? No, 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 John, that's a joke. <laughs> yeah. but it's then, funny, I live... Yeah, go on, finish. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Well, no, but I... Well, no, you bring up, because you mentioned, the, nu you mentioned the nuclear sub. Hang on, okay. now, now I got my anecdote. I got to get it out because it's okay. going to eat away <laughs> the, what's left of the cortex of my brain. So the thing I love about New York and what I hate about the current discourse about the death of New York, the demise of New York. I also don't like the pushback against it. I thought Jerry Seinfeld's op-ed was unfunny and sanctimonious and just unnecessary. But you know, I spent some time in Manhattan since lockdown and since you know, COVID living under social distancing and it is still a very vibrant place. Yes, a lot of people have left because needs must and economically the city has taken it a, a, a battering as you would expect, but it will return. I have no doubt about that. But I also don't like the caricature of New Yorkers and their political, say, there you go, and their political- Well, you from the bed, yeah? Oh, since he was six weeks old. And once <laughs> that starts, that never ends. If you try to kick him off, he just gives I mean, you a yeah, look. Yeah, 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 but I- He, I, sort I, of, he gives I, you the, the, the consummate fuck off look. So anyway, I lived in an apartment, my wife and child on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. In that apartment building, Colin Powell's daughter lived, kind of interesting. Uh, and also this lovely couple, they must have been in their 70s and they would travel the world. They would go on African safari together. They would go to Far East Asia. I mean, they were, they were going everywhere. I always see them returning from holiday. And so we'd always strike up a conversation and you know, I was doing CNN and they'd see me on TV and then we, they would wanna talk about politics and all that. And so finally it occurred to me to ask, what, what, do, you, what do you guys do? What did you do for a living and all that? And they said, we were both, uh, nuclear physicists, an engine. One was, I think, a nuclear physicist. The other was a, a, a engineer. I said, "Oh, that's fascinating." And how did you meet? Uh, you know, we worked for the U.S. government back in the day. I said, "Oh, okay." And then, you know, like two or three conversations later, um, they're like, "Did you ever see that movie, The Hunt for Red October?" I said, "Who has it? Of course, that's that's the best Clancy book yeah. and film." And they said, "Well, you remember the the submarine, right?" that they want that, you know, the silent runner and all that. And I said, yeah. And they said, you know that Clancy famously based that novel on a true story of, you know, the Americans getting their hands on this very deeply classified high tech Soviet sub. So yeah. So well, we were the ones who figured out how the machinery in the submarine worked. And it was only thanks to the British who stole the schematics and passed it along to CIA, Naval, whatever. Anyway, so I was like, oh, so I'm, I, I'm, I've got living history in my apartment building. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was like 26, 2017. And, you know, the, the wife was going out with the, the pink hat and the buttons and the, you know, the, doing the women's march. And the husband was like cheering her on. And it was just like, you know, here you've got these uh, dyed in the wool liberal Americans who probably in five minutes of their professional life did more to safeguard democracy and to range against totalitarianism than either one of us will ever do. And it's just, you know, this idea of, you know, I mean, pinko America versus gun-toting, <clears throat> Bible-thumping America. It's just, it's, it's, it's very banal. It's not even, it's just, it's just boring. You know, it, does, it, just, it doesn't hold true. And it, does, and Matt, it doesn't matter where you go in the country, by the way, you will find examples of this. Um, Yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's... Uh... I, I feel, I mean, like... It, it, it's, not, it's not proper to say this if you're British and English, but I love my country. Um, and um, I love and, your country, too. Sometimes I love it more than my own. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I love pubs. I mean, pubs are... Pubs are still pubs, but you, they're kind of, they've got all sorts of weird and sad rules in at the moment. I understand why. 
I'm not fighting against those rules at all. It's a matter of public health. But nevertheless, um, we'll get our cities back. So um, Sam Pepys wrote, um, there were times when he went to the, um, the corn market, which was the, um, the London Stock Exchange before it was the London Stock Exchange. Oh. And um, he would have only seen 10 people there the whole day. Um, during the time of the plague, and London came back, and so will New York. And then he wrote famously about the fire. Yeah. And, and, and I came back from that too. Yes. Um, yeah. No, it was it Johnson who said, uh, a man who's tired of London is tired of life. I feel that way too. I always like going, it's, it's my, the only other city I could live in indefinitely again in my life, apart from New York. Um, and I don't know what it is about it, but there you go. Mine, um, the only, I, I might be able to live in New York. The only other place I'd really like to live in is Pyongyang. <laughs> You've been listening to The Last Call. Thank you, and um, join us again on Monday. Cheers.